Good morning and welcome to Calvary OPC's worship service for April 12th, 2020. It is Easter morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's a joy uh, to welcome you to worship uh, with us today. Uh, In particular, we welcome those who are joining us as visitors virtually. We wish that we could all be together, but we're still grateful to be able to join in worship of the Lord uh, this Lord's Day morning to celebrate our Savior's resurrection from the dead. Children, I want to encourage you again as we worship this morning to do your best to participate, uh, to pay attention, uh, to sit up and to sing, and uh, to, to remember that Christ is honored as we do our best to worship him, even though it's, it's hard, isn't it, to worship in these kinds of circumstances. I want to remind you that all our midweek ministries have resumed via Zoom video conference. Uh, if, you've, if you would like to connect with one of those studies, even though you haven't in the past, uh, we'd be happy to help you do that. So just reach out to us and we'll give you a hand with that. Uh, in light of this difficult providence of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the elders have uh, decided to have a day of fasting and prayer on April 17th. We invite the congregation to join us in that on April 17th. Uh, Caleb, Al, and Jeremy will be coordinating that day, and you can expect to receive uh, more information on that this coming week. Thank you for continuing to support our ministry, as well as our support of our missionaries and church planters through your regular giving. Uh, We give thanks to God that he's continued to provide uh, for our needs here at Calvary. You can mail checks to the church address, or you can set up uh, regular giving through the online giving as well. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. And let's take a moment now to quiet our hearts before the Lord uh, with silent prayer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 98, verse 1. Psalm 98, verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Let's sing praise to the Lord with hymn 360, Christ the Lord is risen today, hymn 360.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we hail you, our God, our King, our Redeemer. We praise you, the immortal and invisible God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This morning, we join with all the elect saints in every generation. The church triumphant, we join our hearts and our voices together to say, to him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We praise you, O God, for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, descended from David according to his humanity, but but whom you declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead through the Spirit of holiness. Help us by the same Spirit of holiness to worship and adore you this day. Help us to praise and glorify your exalted name. Help us to not lose heart. Help us to not lose heart even though our outer self This mortal coil is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. For just as you raised your son Jesus from the dead, you will also raise us with Jesus and bring us into thy holy presence. Father, hear us now as we pray together using the words our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll confess our faith this morning using the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 57 and 58, which speak of the blessed comfort that is ours in Christ. People of God, how does the resurrection of the body comfort you? Not only will the soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but also my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my spirit and made like Christ's glorious body. How does the promise of life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart has ever imagined, a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. Our responsive reading comes from Psalm 16. I'll read the regular typeface. You'll respond by reading the bold. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, They are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. 
In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. to our God once again in prayer as we confess to him our sins. Almighty God and merciful Father, we come as your beloved sheep to confess our sins and our failures. We have not loved in deed and in truth. We confess that we have not kept the commands of our risen Lord to love you, our God, with all of our heart mind, soul, and strength, and to love one another. We have grumbled against your providence and your perfect care. Father, forgive us our sins. Look on the perfect goodness and holiness of Jesus our Lord. The scriptures call us to press on in faith, and that is our prayer this morning. Let none of us stumble not to rise again. Let none of us doubt not to believe and hope again. We cry out to you with the words of your apostle. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved, the words of assurance come to us this morning from 1 John 1, 5 through 9. Hear these words from your God. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise God for his abundant mercy and pardon through Jesus Christ. Let's respond to God's mercy by singing hymn 365, Thine Be the Glory.
Let's all give our attention to the reading of Holy Scripture. The text this morning is John chapter 16, verses 16 through 22. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is God's word. May he add his blessing to its reading. Let us pray together. I will give to the Lord the thanks due his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. O Lord, our God, worthy creator and redeemer of your people, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our risen Lord, and we come with praise to you, praise that you alone deserve. Thank you that in Christ we have a place in your kingdom and in your family. Thank you for his atoning death and his powerful resurrection from the dead. We rejoice today that you have raised us up with him and have seated us with him in the heavenly places. And how glad we are to know that the day of Christ's appearing will come when we will be raised with him and be like him when we see him as he is. Lord, help us to think much about the coming glory and to long for it as we labor now in a world of brokenness and suffering. Lord, we continue under the burden of the virus that has attacked so many people in our world, and we plead with you to remove it from us. Heal those who are under its attack. Comfort the many who have lost friends and family in these days of the pandemic. Show your love to the world by leading many of your people to speak of Christ and by drawing many to faith in your Son. And give us all insight and power to love our neighbors in the best ways at this time. Give us grace to sacrifice our own comfort for the good of others. We also pray for our leaders, help them to lead with wisdom, and help us all to submit to them and to pray for them. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have to come to you with our requests knowing that you are a good and loving Father and that you love to hear the prayers we give. We come as children, loved by you and purchased by the blood of Jesus. Increase our faith, O Lord, 
even as we make our requests to you. There are some in our congregation who are suffering physically, and we ask humbly that you would be near them, provide for them, and restore them to full strength and health. We pray for Joel Masenko. Remove the muscular pain that continues to afflict her. We pray for Danny Olinger. Thank you so much for the improvement that he has enjoyed these recent days. We pray that complete healing would come. Give him strength and patience as he waits for his scheduled surgery. We pray as well for Carolyn Hirsch and her mother, Bernie, who is caring for her, for Betty Drinnen, for Mark Schneider, for others who are struggling. We commit them to you and pray for your blessing upon them. Bless and provide for each of these, your children, and restore them to full strength and health. Lord, we pray for Joe Rothschild, now home from the hospital. He remains so weak, Lord, and we ask that you would be present with him and heal him. We pray also for Linda, Michael, and Jordan. Give them strength and provide them rest as they care for our brother. Lord, help us all to endure the sufferings of life in ways that show the world that you are strong for your people. Thank you for remembering that we are dust. Thank you for knowing our sorrows, for numbering our days. And thank you for blessing us with many precious promises that are all yes in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the great promise of everlasting life and joy. Father, how glad we are to have a Savior who knows everything, including the hardships of life. One who felt those hardships in his own days of poverty and suffering. Thank you for our sympathetic high priest, our elder brother who sits in heaven and continually prays for us his brothers and sisters who live here. Thank you for the honor you have given us to proclaim the gospel of peace to this world. Thank you for placing us here as a light to our neighbors. Help us, Lord, to love people well, to give our lives generously to others, and to speak of your grace and its life-transforming work in us and in all who call upon your name. We pray for our missionaries who serve you overseas. Provide for them. Empower them to serve you well. Be near them as they labor under the same threats to their health that have come to us here. We pray for our church planters in the U.S., and we pray in the same way. Give them grace, Lord, to serve you well in these difficult times. And give them growing confidence in you as they do. Lord, help us all to live gladly according to your word. Help us to walk in the ways of the righteous, in love and in good works. We do battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we confess that there are times when we do not feel victorious in the fight. Lord Jesus, fight for us and in us. Give us strength, the very strength we need, to resist the evil one, to lay aside besetting sins, and to live happily under your kind rule. We want to show to the world that we are your family and that we belong to you, that our hope is in you, our joy is in you, that peace has come through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
We praise your name. Even now as this prayer is closing, help us to continue in the spirit of prayer in our worship. Give us a sense of your presence and your pleasure in us as we receive your promises and commands in your holy word. Use the truth to shape us. Your word is truth. Receive our thanks and forgive our many sins in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the place in our worship service when we present our gifts to the Lord. We can't do that, of course, but we can remember to send our gifts through a check in the mail or online. And as we do give, let's also remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, made himself to be poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Let us unite our hearts and voices now as we sing the doxology and praise to God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege of offering our gifts to you. We ask that you would use them for the increase of your kingdom and the glory of your holy name. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is Luke 24, verses 36 to the end of the chapter. I'm going to read the entire chapter of Luke 24 to enter into the amazing events of uh, this first Easter morning to get our, get our bearings here on what the disciples were feeling on this day. Let's hear God's holy word, Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen." Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the older women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, 
concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. And they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem." You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he, left, then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is God's word. Let's ask his blessing in prayer. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would, that you would bless us now by your spirit. That you would give us joy in our risen Savior. You know our needs. You know where we are as individuals this day. And so we pray that you give us the joy of knowing the risen Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his name. Amen. This passage is one of my favorite, and I've been so excited to open it together this Easter morning. This passage is undeniably one of the most extraordinary days in all of history. Uh, the first Easter morning. And you notice here that the first Easter morning did not begin with a sunrise service. Uh, it began 
in utter darkness, in doubt, in confusion, in overwhelming sadness. I think it's helpful for us to try to remember what it would have felt like here. Jesus has now been dead for three days, and the grief of all of the disciples is deepening and settling in. Uh, It is on this early Easter morning that this band of women made their tearful trek down to Jesus' tomb with those burial spices. But they were halted in that funeral procession by those gospel-preaching angels who said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen just as he said. Of course, they were stunned by that. And they ran and they went back to the disciples and they proclaimed this good news to the fuller company of those disciples. In fact, the rest of that Easter morning included a lot of running, you remember. Uh, Running back and forth from the tomb to the disciples, to the tomb, back again, trying to confirm if this is really true, that Jesus is risen from the dead. And many of the disciples found it very hard to believe. Uh, They found it hard to process. The classic example of that, I think, is Cleopas and his companion, those two disciples that Jesus met on the road to Emmaus. Cleopas had heard about this report of the empty tomb, uh, this report of the angels and the resurrection. The news we find is starting to spread here, and yet Cleopas and his companion were not rejoicing yet. They still were bitterly mourning the death of Jesus. And uh, finally, we, as we read earlier, Cleopas and his companion Uh, as uh, hear from Christ, and then finally their eyes are opened as Jesus breaks the bread with them, and they see him, they recognize him, and as quickly as they see and recognize him, he vanishes from them. This is an unbelievable day here. Try to imagine what this was like. And, And so as that happens, they turn back and go back to Jerusalem, and there we are in that room uh, with the disciples. They are fearful, They are isolated. It's not too different from our present circumstances today. And suddenly, into that experience of fear and of darkness and of confusion and isolation, Jesus appears in the living room. There he is with them on that day. They see him, they interact with him, and we are told here that they're filled with all kinds of emotions. Of course they are. Uh, But in particular, we're told here by Luke that some of them disbelieved for joy. What an incredible statement that is. And then at the end of the passage, we read that they return to Jerusalem with great joy. The whole passage we're looking at this morning is actually sandwiched between those two statements about joy. They disbelieved for joy, verse 41, and they returned to Jerusalem and worshipped with great joy, verse 52. This is a passage that draws us into joy. And this Easter morning, in the midst of our confusion, In the midst of our isolation and our fear and our darkness, we have the privilege of remembering that the only lasting joy, indeed the only joy we need in this life, is the joy of knowing the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that that is true? He is the only joy we need and he is the only joy that lasts in a world that is passing away. And even as we feel it passing away, as so many things are stripped away from us, it is so good for us to see that we have this joy that endures. I think it's immensely relevant to our lives uh, in these present circumstances. How is your joy doing in these days? How are you dealing with your fears in these days? As we think about the future, 
and our uncertainty of what it holds. Are you filled with the love of Christ that casts out all fear? In these days, it, we can acknowledge that we have very real uncertainties that God has brought into our lives. But still, we do not want to lose sight of the very real certainties that God has brought into our lives as well. And those are the certainties that come to us in our Savior who is risen from the dead. In our passage here this morning, Jesus does three things that I think should fill us with unspeakable joy. And if we really believe these things, if we really take them into our hearts, they will transform our lives. They will give stability to us in the midst of an unstable time. And here they are. Uh, If Christ is yours and he is yours by faith, then you can be full of joy today, first of all, Because Jesus has risen and he's proven his resurrection to you. Second of all, you can have joy because Christ has opened his scriptures to you. And then third of all, you can have joy because Jesus has promised to you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at those three things together here. The the reasons that you can have joy. First of all, you can have joy because Jesus has proven his resurrection to you. And I, I think he does so in a few ways here with the disciples. First of all, he proves his resurrection as he enters that room and he offers them peace. Look at verse Uh, 36 there. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace to you. What an incredible thing for Jesus to say. That is more than just a greeting that Jesus gives them there. That is a blessing that he alone can give. It's somewhat like the blessing that the high priest Aaron gave uh, after he went uh, into the Holy of Holies. And I think that uh, this blessing is sort of a shorthand for that blessing of Aaron because this Jesus is the great high priest. He has just completed the work of atonement. He has completed the final day of atonement. He's gone into the most holy place with his own shed blood as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now he comes out of the Holy of Holies to the people of God and he says... Peace to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord give to you peace. And Jesus has the right to offer that peace to us because he has risen from the dead. Paul says in Romans 4 verse 25 that Jesus Christ was raised for your justification, for your being made right with God. And so he has the right to offer peace because he has died and he has risen again from the dead. He has borne all of your shame and all of your guilt and condemnation and paid the cost to make a failure like you and like me into a friend of God. That's what Jesus offers here as he enters this room. It's no wonder then that they're frightened, that they're even doubting. This seems too good to be true. And so Jesus says to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? He's ministering peace to them here. He's already giving them the blessings of his resurrection life by offering them peace. He also proves his resurrection here, you notice, by letting them touch him. He lets them touch him. He says, see my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as I have. Jesus here is proving. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke emphasizes that Jesus showed himself to the disciples with many infallible proofs. Here it is that he is doing this. But you know, it is that time of year, year of Easter, when uh, if you flip on the History Channel, um, 
you will find that they are almost certainly running specials uh, with so-called experts telling us that these disciples uh, almost certainly did not see this, that they were seeing things, that they were hallucinating when they, they think they saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, the, the hilarious thing about that assertion is that that is exactly what the disciples themselves thought was happening. Uh, they thought they were seeing a ghost. And I think that is one of the most compelling things about the Gospels in their, their telling of the resurrection is they have this kind of embarrassing honesty to them. No one would have ever said that they disbelieved for joy if they were making this up. They would have said they believed for joy, and here's the reason why. But no, they found it very hard to believe that this was true. Uh, and so Jesus invited them over. He allowed them to touch uh, his own physical body. Jesus proves his resurrection by letting them touch him. But finally here, related to that, Jesus proves his resurrection by eating food in front of them. It's interesting that Luke describes that here. And while they were still disbelieving for joy, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? And they gave him this piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. Why? It's to prove his bodily resurrection. 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4, John says, That which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes and looked on and touched with our hands, we proclaim to you. And that's what they saw and touched here. Not a spirit, not a hallucination, but a real flesh and blood, hungry, risen man. A man who would eat and who would drink for the rest of eternity. A man who will eat and drink for the rest of eternity with you and with me in glory. Don't you look forward to that? That's our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We will enjoy that with this risen Savior for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. And so the point here is that Jesus, by many proofs here, is, is showing that he has risen from the dead. But the thing is that these disciples were experiencing exactly what the Old Testament scriptures said they were going to experience. And Jesus did not merely want those disciples to go out and proclaim their personal experience of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. As important as that was and is, he wanted them to proclaim, most importantly, the Old Testament scriptures, which everywhere testified to exactly what they were experiencing right then and there. And that is what we see next of all here, that Jesus opens up to them, that Jesus pours unspeakable joy into their hearts, and into our hearts by opening up the scriptures of the Old Testament to show them how they spoke of him. Let's see that next of all here. Jesus gives us joy by opening these scriptures. <clears throat> he does a couple things here I want you to notice. First of all, Jesus shows them the whole message of the Old Testament scriptures is about him. Verse 44 then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. So what's Jesus doing here? Jesus here, if he had a camera, he would be zooming out. He is zooming out to the panoramic view of the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. And he's saying all of it, the law, the, the Psalms, and the prophets, that's a way of speaking shorthand of all of the scriptures of the Old Testament, they are all about me. What, what an unbelievably audacious claim that is. Can you imagine anyone else picking up a book and saying, this is all about me? Abraham never said that. Moses never said that. David never said that. But Jesus says, it's all about me. What's more, he says, 
It speaks specifically about what I came to do. It all spoke about how the Christ should suffer and that he would rise from the dead on the third day. In other words, the gospel is not something that appears on the scene out of nowhere 2,000 years ago. The gospel is something that God had prepared and proclaimed through the prophets long beforehand in very clear ways. It's old. And then he preached to them a sermon to prove that the scriptures had long proclaimed this. Now, I think it's fascinating here in Luke 24 that we do not have the text of Jesus' sermon uh, to the disciples. Fascinating is kind of an understatement. I think it's kind of irritating, actually. As a preacher and one who teaches other preachers as well, I, I think to myself, why don't we have this sermon? We don't even have an outline of this sermon that Jesus gave here. Now, we have other sermons, at least outlines of them, that others preached in the Bible. Why not this one? Well, I have a theory why. It's because... It drives us back to the scriptures themselves. You know, as a pastor, there's nothing so fun as finding the uh, sermon notes of one of your favorite preachers. And you see, when you open up the Old Testament, these are the sermon notes of our Lord Jesus Christ. From Genesis 1 all the way through the history and the poets and the prophets and the wisdom all the way through the end of it, it is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Old Testament is the sermon notes of Jesus that, that he inspired in the prophets by his spirit. Does it, does it sound like too much to say? That's what Peter says himself. Listen to this, 1 Peter 1, verses 9 and 10. The Spirit of Christ inspired the Old Testament prophets to write about his sufferings and his subsequent glories. So what do you think Jesus said on that day to the disciples? I don't know exactly what he said. But I have no doubt that it included things like these. That he said to them, I am the second Adam. I am your second Adam who came and actually obeyed the law of God in your behalf. That I am your better able, whose blood speaks a better word for your salvation. I am your better Isaac, who willingly was bound as a sacrifice for God's people. That I am your suffering Joseph, who went into exile and through whose sufferings God's people were saved and the nations were blessed. That I am the better Moses who led you out of a greater slavery in a greater exodus from salvation, from sin, and from death. That I am your greater king, the son of David and David's Lord, that man after God's own heart who brings justice and righteousness for God's people. I have no doubt, he said, I am your great high priest. I am the final sacrifice. I am your scapegoat that was sent off into the wilderness and forsaken. That I am your sin offering. I am your hyssop that brings cleansing to purify you. That I am the Passover lamb whose blood is spread across your home and says death will not come to you and your house. That I am your persecuted prophet who brings God's final word and who, who is rejected on your behalf, that I am the lamb and the priest and the temple, that I am your suffering servant that Isaiah foretold, and I am the Messiah whose body would not see corruption, as we read earlier in Psalm 16. I have no doubt that Jesus said, if you just look, you will see that the scriptures are all about me. That's how Jesus proved 
and showed and poured into our hearts the joy that is ours by showing that this has always been God's plan and it is centered on this Savior who has come for us and risen from the dead. And he also showed them not only that the Old Testament scriptures were all about him, but that, that these scriptures propel us outward toward the end of the gospel. He says that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses of these things. What an incredible message that is that Christ gave to his church to take to the ends of the world, that Jesus forgives sinners who acknowledge that they are sinners and repent of their sins and look to him in faith. It's exactly the message that you and I need today. As I look back on a life of failures and of sin of which I am ashamed, Jesus says, I came to forgive you of all of those sins. And to take your shame and to clothe you in my robes of righteousness. You know, people in this world are spending fortunes trying to find what Jesus will give you today for free. He will give you a cleansed conscience and a forgiven soul. And Jesus says that that message of forgiveness and repentance has been given to us not just to hold on to ourselves, but that we would take it to the ends of the earth. He says, you are my witnesses. Now, where does the Old Testament say that? It does say it. I think Jesus is thinking of passages like Genesis 12, where God said to Abraham, in your seed all the nations will be blessed. In Psalm 2, where God said of Christ, ask of me and I will give you all of the nations to be your inheritance. And Isaiah 49, where God said that the Messiah will be a light to all of the nations and then he said to the Messiah's people, you are my witnesses of these things. What an incredibly joyful mission that Jesus has given to us to be a part of. It's almost too much to take in. And it is certainly too much for us to take out to the world on our own. And that's why Jesus gives to us his spirit. That's the last thing I want us to see here, that Jesus fills us with great joy because he promises his spirit to us. Look at verse 49 there to the end of the chapter. We read, and behold, Jesus says, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple blessing God. Well, there it is. Uh, Just days earlier, we read that they disbelieved for joy, but now they return to Jerusalem with great joy. What has changed in them? Everything has changed in them. Their entire perspective now has changed. Now they are viewing their life and all of their mission now, not just through Jesus' death, but through Jesus' death and his resurrection. Their hope has not been in vain. That's what they see now, that the vanity of this life has permanently been broken in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And and what is more than that, now they understand, as Jesus has said to them elsewhere, that the best is yet to come. He says to them elsewhere, it is better for you that I go away. And that's what we behold at the end of Luke chapter 24, uh, that Jesus goes away. He ascends into heaven. And it's almost as though the words of Psalm 24 are acted out here before us. We, We read that psalm together last week. It's like Jesus cries out in the words of that psalm, lift up 
your heads, O gates, and be ye lifted up, O ancient of doors, that the King of glory may come in. Uh, What a command for the King of glory to give to heaven. Only he can issue it. And Psalm 24 says heaven is stunned by that. The response is this. Who is this King of glory? And Jesus replies, I am the King of glory. I am the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. I am the one who is worthy to enter heaven because I am the one with clean hands. I am the one with a pure heart. And so the gates rose up. The saints and angels fell down and worshipped him with great joy along with the saints on earth. And, uh, and Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. And he said, Father, it is finished. Now it is time for us to send forth the Spirit. To pour it out on the church. And why? Well, in order to assure us that we belong to him, that we are his children, that we're not orphans, but we are God's beloved children who can cry out to him, Abba, Father. In order to empower us to share this gospel good news with the ends of the earth to our neighbors who do not have this hope. And in order to give to us joy that is inexpressible and beyond what we could ever gain or keep in this passing world. This is the joy we need right now. These are hard weeks, aren't they? Hard weeks for us at Calvary. And they're hard weeks for the whole world. As we watch death and plague march around the globe, and we feel the fear, don't we? We feel the fear of what the future holds for our health, uh, for our employment, for our bank accounts, for our church on the other side of all of this. And it's okay to acknowledge those things and take them to the Lord. But let's take those things to the Lord, not forgetting that we have the only ultimate solution to these fears, and that is Jesus Christ who is risen from the dead. How should that hope change us in these days? I think it should change us in two ways that I want to reflect on here briefly as we close this morning. First of all, it should impact where your hope is, where your hope should be. You know, this world seeks every kind of joy in this world and every kind of joy uh, that this world cannot give. Uh, to meet the sorrows that we are experiencing right now. But real joy is not found by looking away from death and fear, but by staring down death and fear with Jesus, our risen Savior. He is the one who, who has passed through death into eternal life for us. Uh, and if you are in him, you are able to say that for me to live is Christ. And to die would be gain. Nothing will be able to separate me from my Savior. And if that is true for you, then like these disciples here, you can worship the Lord with great joy and you can continually be in the temple blessing God. We can do that today, brothers and sisters, not because we are in some temple, physically speaking, but because we are, by the Spirit, the temple. We are the temple of the living God. The Spirit has been poured into us and we have been joined together as living stones to be a dwelling place for the Lord our God. And that is the unshakable, joyful possession that is ours in Jesus Christ, by His Spirit. That should be the source of our joy today, that we're joined to Christ, and in him we're joined to one another, and that can never be taken away from us. So this is a passage that tells us where our joy should be. But second of all, I think this is a passage that tells us where our focus should be. And it should be on Christ and on heaven. 
Listen to these words of Jesus in John chapter 16. These are words about sorrow. They're words also about joy. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. You will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. He says, I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. What incredible words those are that our Savior who, who went away told us, I'm coming again. And when I see you on that day, I will pour joy into your heart that will never be diminished or disrupted in even the slightest way. Those are words, and that is a hope that we need to focus on. And if we do, that hope will stabilize us now and comfort us now and give us joy now that just cannot be taken away. This is the promise of your Savior. Your resurrection-proving Savior. Your peace-extending Savior. Your Scripture-opening Savior and your Spirit-giving Savior. Savior. He is risen. And he is reigning over all things. And he will see you again. And that is why we as Christians, brothers and sisters, can rejoice with joy inexpressible. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the joy that Christ has poured into the hearts of his church. And we thank you that we are your people, that we are your temple, that we are able to rejoice today with joy inexpressible because you fill us with your spirit and you've promised to us promises that are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you give us great peace in these things as we do look to you this day in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's sing together to praise our Lord with hymn 277, uh, Before the Throne of God Above, hymn 277. Receive now the blessing of your God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Amen.